Welcome everyone and thanks uh, for participating in this talk. I'm Cecilia Maskell, I'm Professor of Mobile System at the University of Cambridge. And today I would like to talk about um, my research and um, this is just to set the scene. Generally, uh, I'm interested in trying to find ways of sensing behavior that is difficult to, to generally sense. So somehow, um, it, it would be good to have continuous input for some uh, diagnostics or some uh, well-being aspects. Um, so when you go to the doctor, often you only get a sample perhaps of uh, your heartbeat every time you go. Wouldn't it be good if we could um, get input from your heart continuously? There are already techniques that do that. That was a simple example. Um, then sometimes uh, there is some... Um, some information that uh, doctors would like to obtain that often requires the user input and attention. And can we have a proxy for that so that users don't have to continuously input their data? Or sometimes we have come up with sensing techniques that are good, but they are expensive or uh, they are inaccurate. And can we get better? Can, can we do things better? And obviously, Every case where we have devised a way to get input from our body, but that's invasive or it could be dangerous for the person. So can we have other proxies for that? And uh, so in this talk, I'll give you uh, some examples of my research in this area, and uh, I will highlight uh, the limits and uh, perhaps the challenges of doing such thing. So the first example I want to give is about fitness. Uh, if I was in an in-person audience, I would ask you to I count the number of head, uh, the hands that are raised if I ask you if you have done this uh, fitness test ever in your life. This is a test to measure your uh, VO2 max, the volume of oxygen that your lungs can intake and then it's transfer um, to the bloodstream, to your muscles, and then transform into energy. So it's a good proxy for fitness. But as you can see, it's an expensive um, exercise, both at the level of um, <laughs> strenuous on the body, and as well as it requires all this equipment. So it's not very portable and uh, not very scalable because it's uh, not very affordable. So uh, people have come up with techniques to proxy this kind of information. Fitness is a good also itself is a good proxy for cardiovascular health and cardiovascular health uh, is a big deal these days. Um, and it has been recognized as one of the most important to, to take care of uh, for population's health. So um, proxies for fitness, or then proxies for, uh, for health are, um, have been simple things such as questionnaires asking you how many times uh, you exercise. And those are um, also, um, used in combination with demographics and uh, weight, as well as recently with uh, resting heart rate information. So this, this uh, have been an example of, uh, of estimates that do not use continuous information. However, uh, they're not super accurate estimates and other uh, have tried in small scale studies to come up with better estimates. In this uh, work that we are um, producing, this is, this is new work, right? This is a keynote, so I can talk about the, the, the work we are doing rather than the super published work. Um, so the, this first part is uh, not yet available. But we have tried to use data from a large cohort to um, monitor um, and track and see if we can predict fitness in, in, in a cohort. And I'll explain a little bit more about uh, the details of this. So the study design is um, that there is a group of people that um, epidemiologists in Cambridge have been tracking for years, and uh, it's called it Finland, and it has 11,000 people. They have been tracked by uh, been giving them some VO2 mass test, the one that you have seen, getting some uh, anthropometric measures such as uh, weight, height, and BMI, and some other questionnaires of activity, as well as uh, for six days, um, wearing a chest strap sensor that had an accelerometer and a heart rate monitor to uh, collect this continuous data. Uh, one important thing is that this cohort has been tracked and uh, 
seven years later, as Muller cohort subset of those uh, has also been tracked in the same way. So there's a there's a there's two cohorts, uh, two groups in the same cohorts, and we have um, then applied some machine learning to the data with the challenges of having such large data and such um, high level of uh, information, especially on the wearable data side. And we have um, tried three tasks. I will talk mainly about the first two, um, trying to predict cardiorespiratory health um, by using um, this data and um, instead of uh, using the VO2 max, the VO2 max as a test is the ground tooth and we try to use uh, the, the accelerometer plus anthropometric measures uh, and uh, movement and, and heart rate data to predict the VO2 max and see what error we have. And then we've also tried to predict the fitness direction. Will someone become more or less fit, um, you know, benchmarked with respect to the age with respect to, to that? And yes, we've looked at also how the model adapts, but I'm, I won't talk about that. So just a, a very quick set of um, results about that. Uh, it looks like considering data from wearable devices, so the fact that we have an accelerometer in addition to the resting heart rate and all the measures um, that one can take um, as a spot check and documenting measures is a better, a better way. So the error of our model uh, with respect to the ground truth is lower in this case than in all the other cases, just using the metrics, just using the heart rate, using both and using also the wearable sensor data. So there's a good result here showing that um, it, it, it's good to actually have this wearable data. And, and this is a large scale study that proves it. So um, it, it's quite interesting. The, um, the results are also uh, visualized at the bottom here. As you can see, we tend to under predict the VO2 max in, in some of the cases. So there's more than the analysis that can be, can be looked at if you're interested. The second task, um, is about predicting the change in fitness uh, in seven years. As I said, we have this uh, smaller cohort. Um, now here we have divided, so this is the distribution of the change in fitness. So uh, zero means that people have not changed the VO2 max level at all, or at least a little bit, you know, the, the middle um, quantile is the one that hasn't changed much over the years. And you can see it's most of the people. But our techniques are actually quite good at predicting the extreme. So uh, a task that says, are you in the middle or are you in the extremes, does quite well here on the right um, axis, a right figure here, you can see that we have a 0 0.4 prediction in a binary task that is uh, temp attempting to predict if someone is getting uh, really um, in, in, into the extreme cases. Um, I will now switch gear and show you another example of sensors that can be used uh, to um, understand health. This is obviously, we've seen that in, in the previous case, it was an example of large scale, uh, well-established uh, sensor techniques that the community, our community has been um, using for years and now has been brought into practice into epidemiology to try to see if we can estimate population health and population fitness. And this is our attempt instead to use the next generation devices um, to and see if they could possibly lead us to detect uh, health and behavior. This is a paper that in fact is published and you, uh, there's, a, there's an indication at the end, at the bottom of uh, where you can find it. Um, the idea here is uh, earables are seen as the next smartphone in terms of um, in terms of what they could be and the kind of penetration and importance that these wearable devices can have. Already the prediction for 2022, uh, which uh, this is already kind of um, almost there is that they are the main wearable being worn. And I think the pandemic has just made things worse. I'm wearing them all, all day just to uh, talk through Zoom. Now, the, the, the underpinning concept that we're using in the study to um, talk about our um, trying to, to detect uh, behavior is the fact that some of these earbuds have an inner microphone um, that is uh, blocked behind this uh, rubber bit uh, that goes inside the ear. And uh, this uh, rubber bit creates an occlusion effect which um, amplifies sound waves and amplifies uh, smaller frequencies. And this is helping us to detect 
some vibrations, which can mean something for our ear. And so the inner microphone is able to get those. So what are these things that we're able to detect through this process of occlusion? Um, so the, we, we, we notice, first of all, that there are a number of activities that we could try to detect. These are simple activities. And uh, we, we notice here that on, on the top, you have um, a person still and a person uh, at the bottom, in the bottom row, and a person moving the head. And we notice that the two graphs, the two rows are very similar, which means that for all the activities, um, the head movement has little effect on the data, which means that great, we can detect activities through this concept of occlusion effect and then understanding um, the, the bone conductor of our body vibration that can, can then uh, repercuss into our ear and, um, um, and amplify this by this occlusion effect. Um, so it's possible to detect these activities. Uh, we have uh, made a little prototype to um, try to, 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 to understand how these activities uh, can be in fact detected and if we can then apply some methods, some analytics methods. Um, none of the existing earbuds allowed us to play with this. Uh, we, we couldn't get the raw data, therefore we built our own uh, simple prototype. And what can we do with it? Well, the first thing we tried was to try to um, step count to uh, gesture, recognize gestures and obviously recognize activity. I've already given you uh, a glimpse of how well we can recognize activity. So here is a, because I like videos, here's a visualization of um, one of the lead authors in this paper, uh, Dong Ma, walking. Um, and then there is a, um, This is the visualization of the movement. As you can see, as soon as it starts stepping, then we can, he's walking. And um, this is the blue and red lines are the left and the right. And the, the or I should say about the green line. And this is like the final stepping when he's really stepping really hard. And as you can see, the green line is the in-air microphone. So the external microphone in the earbud is not detecting this movement, while the other two uh, left and right, uh, well, the in-ear is obviously in both ears, this is plotting just one, but um, is detecting this movement. These patterns are very, very clear. Oh, sorry. And um, this is again uh, uh, our experiments to detect gestures. So Dong will be tapping various points on his head. And then um, I'll play this other one. And you can see that if it's detected the first, it detected now that it's doing that, it's detecting the third time. And uh, it, it, it is possible to actually detect one from another, especially perhaps as, as a class of uh, quite different um, gestures. Now here is the general performance if we want to talk about that. So starting from this picture, you can tell that uh, by just using the left or the right ear um, or using both the performance uh, precision and recall using uh, two different classifiers improve logistic regression SVM, um, they improve. So it's good to have fusion of the two channels of the two years. Um, the confusion matrix show that we're able to quite well detect the various activities. There's no confusion between the activities. And the table here shows um, the, by, by the different columns, step counts, activity recognition, gesture recognition, um, how we do with respect to other sensing. So if we were sensing with just an accelerometer with the head moving and without the head moving, these are the percentages. Um, so it's detecting step, step would work, step counting would work, but then activity recognition um, decreases considerably with the, with the head movement. Just the recognition too. Um, the external microphone also doesn't do very well. Uh, our approach with inner ear, um, which has been tried with um, head movement, uh, with or without music, works very well and uh, is able to have good performance. Now, I'll, I'll say a bit more about this performance, um, especially with respect to personalization. So 
On the x-axis, you see the different subjects on which we have tried this, and the two uh, the two colors are precision and recall. The first thing you notice is the low level of performance here, which means that for some of the users, the approach didn't work that well. And so what we tried is to add a little bit of personal data. So um, here is, in, in the first figure, this is just the model uh, tried and so trained with data that is not of the same user. So uh, this is data of all the other users, tried on user one, tried on user two. And for some of the users, it, it doesn't generalize very well. and doesn't, I should say, personalize very well. However, uh, if you look here, the pur purple, and as well as the green, um, if you add just um, 10 personal samples to these users, you see that even number two, purple goes up to 90% in performance in both precision and recall. And of course, if you go higher in the number of samples, this is the final graph that shows that if you increase the number of samples per participant, you go up to almost 90, 95 very easily. But already here, you know, the number 10, we are above 90%. So this is, this is really working well. We've also tried, and I'm not showing it here, you can refer to the paper for this, it, the, the trying the different activities on different type of floors. As we are relying on a bone conductance, so vibration generated by, by that um, gen by vibration that is then transported by bone conductance into the ear and then amplified by this occlusion effect, we have tried to see what we could do with different floors and different shoes as well. So that is in the paper and, and, and tells you a little bit about the performance that we have achieved. So one thing we're trying now is go further with this technique and see if in addition to activity, we can use the inner ear microphone to detect uh, other uh, biological signal. And the first one we are trying is heart rate. So this is uh, initial work um, that shows that in fact, but the inner ear microphone in, in, in this is uh, an example in, um, in static mode, stationary mode is able to detect the heartbeat. Um, and you can see here very, very well graphed over time. And at the bottom, you can see our comparison with an ECG, so a ground truth, or over time of the heartbeat and our error. In the stationary case, it works really well. And as we add movement, um, this, this becomes a bit more erratic. But you still have a, a reasonable error we find with respect to um, the ground tooth. Obviously, ECG is not something that would allow you to, you know, no one carries ECG throughout the day. I mean, we, we do that sometimes if we have to have uh, our um, cardiac health, um, then the doctor would give us this whole monitor that you would carry, but it's not something that is very much embedded. It's embedded, for example, in the watch, but then you have to stay very still and do your test with one lead ECG. So this would be something that instead your uh, microphone ear um, your, your microphone in the ear would uh, then be able to do. And we are exploring this, uh, this capability um, these days. The last thing I would like to talk about is something again that um, is not investigating new um, sensing technology, but is investigating what we can do with some data that can be collected in large scale by um, by by the devices that are already in the pockets of many. In other words, uh, this is uh, an app that we have produced for phones um, in COVID times. Um, and I, I can give a completely separate talk on how difficult it was to uh, push out an app with COVID in the title uh, through the Google Play and Apple Store um, in COVID times. Obviously, uh, these companies are doing uh, the right thing and trying to re really, uh, really be quite uh, precise and uh, scrupulous on which app they let on the market. And uh, we had to go through all sorts of uh, authentication um, steps to make sure, to, to really tell them this is, a, this is a, an academic study and it's legitimate and we are truly trying to, to help here. And so what does this app do? Uh, well, the, web, the URL is over there in case you want to see the project in more detail. But in addition to being just a survey app that asks the user for the demographics as well as their symptoms and their medical history, we also collect audio. Uh, so we ask the user to uh, breathe 
into their phone. So they would have their phone like this and they would breathe um, five times and then cough three times and then read the sentence on the, on the phone screen. And all this data will be collected through a microphone in the device and then uh, sent to servers. What was the holy grail here? Well, the idea is that audio um, in it has been started to be established that audio could be a good proxy of our health. Our voice, our cough sometimes, and our breathing can tell a lot about us. So uh, for COVID, but also for other perhaps chronic diseases, it would be good to provide scalable, contactless, affordable, but also I would say sustainable testing. The current COVID tests are quite, um, you know, uh, use and then throw away. They, are, they can be quite um, invasive <laughs> and uh, they, they possibly don't scale as well as a digital solution could do. It's also, this one is contactless, so people could repeat it and it could be good for progression of any disease monitor. So just because uh, we're coming to um, the end of this, um, this talk, to some extent, this, the last part, I, I want to talk about some numbers. Uh, these are people who have uh, given us data. They have um, generated uh, a number of samples and there are more than 30,000 users. They've given us their information and, well, they, they Obviously, you can see from the graph on the location, they could tell us that uh, they, they didn't have to reveal their location. So the most common location is actually none. Um, in addition to this information, we collect their list of symptoms uh, as self-declared, so it's crowdsource information. Uh, we collect um, data about the test. So we ask them when they tested for COVID, if they did, and what was the result of that test? So all of this, the challenges of this data is that it's self-reported. So uh, obviously people lied, uh, people you know, answered uh, incorrectly, just um, involuntarily. Um, but the, the good bit is that there's so much data that we find that, um, uh, that there is there's some good um, to, to do. The idea here is that um, some of the studies have highlighted that perhaps voice and coughs could uh, be could have features specific to the disease. This is an example of um, a healthy cough spectrogram. You see the frequency and the um, COVID cough spectrogram, COVID voice, sorry, spectrogram, healthy and, and COVID. And you can see even just by the eye in this particular case, the, um, the various harmonics are very clear in the first one. And um, there, there is a difference in the high spectrum, um, high frequency ranges in the two. And so features like this could be picked up by models and and then use to distinguish. Um, are we doing it right? Is it working? Well, um, I can point you to the URL and to my webpage. There are um, some papers there uh, that have started to uh, be published around this um, by our group, and you can look at the results. Uh, the, in the indication is that we're going in the right direction, but obviously we might need more data to distinguish between diseases. Um, some diseases, uh, you know, our data, there was no flu season in, in these two years. So we don't know if we'll be able to, to distinguish that. We have some indications that we're able, the model is not confused by data uh, from asthmatic uh, people, and we could possibly distinguish that. Um, and, and this, uh, in a way, could be used as a, as a technique to tell to, to do some sort of pre-screening, even if the performance weren't um, that um, high, because it's, uh, it, it, it's easy to repeat, it's easy to um, administer, it scales, and so it could be used in combination. Um, and, and therefore, I think it's promising. But the most promising part of this is the kind of repeated user data, the longitudinal data that we're trying to um, collect. So here is a, a graph showing the number of samples um, that each user has given us. And you can see up there, there is one user that has given us more than 250 samples over the collection period. And um, I always thank them in any talk I give. But even other users are giving us more than one sample, which means that we have a relatively small, but still a solid sample of users on which we can study and we are studying the progression. And here is a thing I think where a digital um, application could make a real difference because progression would um, 
possibly indicate if someone needs to go to the hospital or if someone is on the on right track to improvement. And it, the personalization aspect involved into this um, could make the the general performance result of the one of tool much better because uh, all of a sudden you have you you hear a voice you learn about that person and and you can and can do better also being digital um the fact that the person need to continuously repeat testing doesn't mean that it's invasive doesn't mean it's uncomfortable so it it becomes a really um a useful thing to to have and to do so um with this, I would like to um, pause and ask for your questions. First of all, uh, though, I would like to thank my team who has uh, worked uh, very hard on these topics. Uh, you can find our work on this webpage. And I would like to finally thank my sponsors, the European Research Council who's uh, funded um, this research and Nokia Bell Lab with whom we are doing some part of the research. Thank you very much.